Narcissism is a word a lot like love. We use it, we talk about it, we don't really know what it means, and we never know if the person we're talking to has the same definition in mind that we do. And narcissism is particularly complicated because of its, its strange history in Greek and Roman mythology. It, it comes from the story of a guy named Narcissus, who is this attractive young man who wandered the woods looking for the ideal partner. He had many suitors he rejected, the most famous being Echo, who repeated everything he said. Eventually, Narcissus stumbled and saw himself in a pool of water. He immediately fell in love with his reflection and froze. He died there. And in his place, a, a flower grew, a daylily, which today we call the Narcissus. The term narciss narcissism or self-love came into psychology in a couple ways. It was first used by somebody named Havelock Ellis, who was a British sexologist, who talked about self-love in a very sort of graphic and physical way that I want to talk about. Um, <laughs> But then Sigmund Freud borrowed the term and used it in several ways. It talked about the sort of the fundamental love or self-esteem that a child would have for him or herself, our connection or our attachment to our own ambitions, he even talked about it as something linked to leadership. Today in psychology, we use the term narcissism in three different ways or to describe three different forms of narcissism. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes from. When most of you think about narcissism, you're probably thinking about what we call grandiose narcissism. This is somebody with an inflated self-concept, maybe a bold or assertive personality, somebody who might be charismatic or extroverted, but also somebody who might be callous, have a strong sense of entitlement, maybe manipulative or willing to you know, use or hurt people. When you think about sort of the classic narcissistic actor or, or you know, politician or um, leader, you're probably thinking about grandiose narcissism. The second form of narcissism, which most of you probably don't think of unless you're in the clinical uh, psychology business, is vulnerable narcissism. These are folks that have some of that same sense of entitlement and the same sense of self-focus, but are relatively shy. And in fact, they can be anxious, have low self-esteem, and be hypersensitive to criticism. So we talk about these sometimes as covert narcissists because they're hard to spot. You don't really see them out there. Um, sometimes we talk about them as shy narcissists because they're shy. Sometimes as basement narcissists, as in living in your mom's basement, spending all your time on the internet and wishing you got the attention that you so rightly deserved while well, be too scared to go outside and meet people. Finally, both of these forms of narcissism are personality traits, I meaning we all sort of vary on it. We all have some level of both of these, and you can be both grandiose and, and vulnerable. But the, but the challenge with narcissism, or one of the challenges is if you become so narcissistic that it sort of pervades all aspects of your life, it can lead to some real problems. So imagine you go to work and you're like, everybody suck up to me, high five, I'm awesome. Well, that, you might be able to get away with that, but then you go home and you're like, hey kids, Daddy's awesome, high five daddy. And then, you want, and then you're like, hey honey, wanna hear about how awesome I am? If you, if you do that and you can't really control it, it can, it can damage your love relationships, damage your performance at work, and eventually be diagnosed as a clinical disorder or narcissistic personality disorder, which is the third form of narcissism. And this is relatively rare. We're talking about one or 2% of the population at any one time. So when you talk about narcissism today, or when I talk about today, I want to talk mostly about the grandiose form, because this is generally what we think about when we talk about narcissism. It's what we have most of the research on. And also, grandiose narcissism has some real benefits as well as costs in life. Most of us think of narcissism as something bad. Nobody's like, hey, I'm, I'm a narcissist, or hey, meet my new boyfriend. He's really narcissistic. You know, it's not... <laughs> It's not, the, it's, not our, it's not like, it's generally considered sort of pejorative, but in the case of grandiosity, it can really help. So grandiose narcissists are really good at starting relationships. You go to a bar and somebody approaches you and they seem really confident and charismatic. Red flag, you know. <laughs> but, but, but these same people, once they're in relationships, have problems because they're more likely to cheat, they're more likely to be a little manipulative, they're more likely to be controlling. Um, same thing with leadership. Grandiosity is really good for becoming a leader, whether in an organization or in politics. The problem is once you're in that leadership role, people who are narcissistic take big risks, they do things to get attention, um, they have ethical challenges or problems that end, to end up bringing them down. One place where we see this benefit of 
narcissism most clearly is in media, and especially social media. We've done about 10 years of research on, on narcissism and social media, and what we find is it, it sort of works. People who are narcissistic have more, more friends or followers or links in social media. They tend to be more active. Um, they take more selfies. They take, they take more selfies with their whole body, not just their face. Uh, they do that. They, they, do very, they do very well in media, and if you think about social media without narcissism, it would, it would be kind of lame. I mean, it would be like cat videos, and somebody saying like, hey, Keith, how you doing, bro? And you're like, fine, and that's it. Um, and where this, where, where this really struck me, I was teaching a, a seminar on narcissism, and like most of my classes, the students are watching their phones the whole time, and so I went over to one of the students I wanted to see what she was looking at, and it was Kylie Jenner, one of the Kardashian gals, driving a Ferrari in Los Angeles. And it kind of blew me away. One, because I mean, she wasn't doing anything. She was just driving a Ferrari. And then I thought about it, and I thought, oh my god, she's a genius. She, she basically disintermediated the entire media structure in society. So, in the old days, if you wanted to do the, you know, Kim, or the Kylie Jenner re reality show, you needed to get a bunch of people and have some scripts or at least a producer and have grips and best boys and all those things. You don't know what they mean at the end of a, of a movie. And then you'd put it together and you'd send it to a network and the network would distribute it to everybody else, to your fans. Kylie got rid of all that. She just got on her phone, filmed herself, sent it right to her fans, which is it's just amazing. It's an amazing change. And so you might say, well, gee, that's a little shallow. I mean, it's not, the, it's not the, the most important thing in the world. But others have used this to really positive ends. So a, a, recent, um, sort of, uh, a recent application of this was the Ice Bucket Challenge, which probably many of you are aware of or even participated with. And this was a, the idea was to raise money and awareness for ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is really a, a, a terrible, debilitating illness. And the, and the idea was you had to give money or you had to dump a bucket of ice water on your head or have your friend do it or whatever. And this really worked with narcissism because you're like, who else is wanting to do this? You're like, hey, look, check me out. I got my ice bucket. It's great. It's not just narcissism. It's also fun. I think I did it with my kids. You know, hey, dump water on dad. Um, it, it, it got a lot of people involved, but narcissism was an important piece of it and it really worked. So it, there are ways we can use some of this narcissism to, to very positive outcomes or very positive ends. Now, I'm not the first person to figure out that in the modern economic or social world that a little bit of narcissism helps, but I think we need to have a careful balance. So right now we have mentors and teachers or professors like myself telling kids, hey, you've got to be a thought leader, you've got to build your brand. I'm like, yeah, maybe, but maybe, you know, have some thoughts. And then at the end of that, you can be a thought leader or, um, you know, maybe build your reputation. Like, I'm a good person who does good work. And then focus on the brand and the turtleneck and everything. So I think, I think there's sort of a process we can use. Um, and, and where this really struck me was my daughter was in kindergarten and she had one of her teachers gave her this all about me assignment. And the idea was, write your special talent. So she was at home, and she said, well, Daddy, what's my special talent? And I said, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't have a special talent. And my wife said, you know, I don't have a special talent. And I said, well, I, I mean, the only kid I've ever met with a special talent was a two-year-old reincarnated llama in Tibet who, who blessed me with a, a Buddha statue, which was pretty cool. But other than that, most kids don't have that. So she wrote, she was nice, which which isn't really special and it's not really a talent, but it's still pretty important, you know? I, not, I mean, it's better than like, I, I'm evil or whatever. Um, so, I, so I felt good about that. So I think the, the thing, I think the, 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 the point is we can learn a lot from narcissism, from understanding narcissism, from narcissistic individuals in our lives about what to do and what not to do. And what we can learn is how to put ourselves out there, be assertive, don't be afraid to dump a bucket of ice on your head for a good cause, um, to, to put yourself and build sort of a broader social network than you might be comfortable doing. 
But what we can also learn is how not to, to let our ego take over our life. We're not the same thing as our ego. And in fact, I, I mean, the best way I think about ego is as a tool in your toolbox. You want to use it, and then you want to put it away and go enjoy the rest of your life. Thank you very much. Thank you.